In this episode of Plants of the Gods, we'll hear host Mark Plotkin in deep conversation with mycologist Paul Stamets, best known for his role in the documentary and accompanying book, Fantastic Fungi. We'll question our understanding of how and why medications and other substances interact with one another, the untapped potential of fungi, and more as Stamets and Dr. Plotkin ponder mushrooms, magic, and mortality. Now, one of the things that I find most commonly misunderstood about the fungal kingdom and and medicine and mind-altering substances is I keep reading that Hoffman invented LSD. And Nature invented LSD. Exactly. <laughs> so, please, I, I want people to well, get that I'm, from I, you. I mean, a fungi, this comes from Aragog, er, 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 a clap step, uh, uh, um, purpurea, purpurea mm-hmm. um, is... Um, is an ergot fungus, and I th- all these fungi are minical, miniature chemical factories. Mm-hmm. They're producing hundreds of thousands of exotic molecules not found elsewhere in nature. Mm-hmm. But here's an example. There's a pachonia fungus uh, that now we know produces ketamine. Mm-hmm. So ketamine was not found, thought to be found in nature, and now we yes. have a fungus that's producing it. Yes. Nature created ketamine before chemists created chem- ketamine, Got it totally backwards. My total, my so I make the prediction exactly. that we'll find a fungus that will produce MDMA. You know, MDMA is an amphetamine. It turns out that a number of fungi produce amphetamine, including Massospora, uh, which is a fungus um, uh, that uh, that has been found recently in the past few years. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought on this. Yeah. On, uh, no, I mean, um, the, the idea that it all comes from the laboratory is just uh, what you're saying, that nature got there first. Nature bats last. Yeah, uh, for sure. And that um, it, it's part of the story that is undertold or misunderstood. And So, no, but I'm sorry, my reconnect the neuron on that one. Um, it's called Massospora cicadensis. It's a, <laughs> it's a fungus that that um, infects cicada, which are in the ground for 17 years. And in Ohio, I saw a cicada outbreak. You know, it's like a locust outbreak. It's mm-hmm. incredibly loud and just bugs everywhere. And they all emerge mm-hmm. in for a two to four week period. And, and they mate and then they die. But they, so they have the, through the, just prior to molting, um, many of them get this fungus. And this fungus is really bizarre. It produces these amphetamine-like compounds. It produces a minute amount of psilocybin, um, but the amphetamines make these these uh, uh, these insects um, fly, and you and it uh, demasculizes and actually rots out rots off the genitals of the male cicadas, and they effeminizes their behavior, so they have a seductive dance. So other males were close, and so the spores then, putatively, we believe, can infect the the new ones, and then they, you know, and then you know they go down underground. You know, um, uh, eggs are laid. You know, pupae and larvae develop, and the fungus then survives. Um, so how bizarre that you would have an amphetamine and a psychoactive tryptamine, psilocybin, being produced by a fungus that parasitizes cicadas. And so, now the chemistry of this is much, much more complex than I initially uh, uh, noticed. There's a great group of scientists that wrote a paper on this. So please, you know, check out their paper on Massapora cicadensis. This is why many ethnobiologists don't read science fiction. This <laughs> nature is more perverse than you any can't science fiction. You can't make this shit up. Exactly. You know? It's just crazy. And, and in uh, Merlin Sheldrick's book, he calls them crazed, sex-crazed, psychedelic, salt-shaker cicadas. Right. (laughs) Which is going to be hard to top. Yeah, I mean, just um, what else is out there, you know? Exactly. And, you know, this this goes, you know, I've had a visionary dream that came true that was just so profound. Um, And I put it in one of my books against the objections of many, many people. This is way before the concept of the multiverse, Mm-hmm. And this is where it gets, we push the envelope of, our, of what we consider to be reality, what we consider to be consciousness, what we consider to be schizophrenia, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, or illusions of grandeur. But 
the Aztecs used psilocybin mushrooms to see into the future. Mm -hmm. That well documented. I mean, mm -hmm. that was one of their visionary quests. That's a big thing, yeah. And they found it as a military advantage. Mm -hmm. Let's let's be able to go into hyperspace to understand what's coming. Right. So let's not uh, doubt the wisdom of indigenous Aztecs. In my own experience, as much as, my, as people vilified for me putting it in writing, it's in my book, Psilocybe Mushrooms of the World. I mean, Aztecs may not have been wrong. I may have been wrong. I may have gotten a glimpse into the multiverse. Now, again, we suffer from the inadequacy of language. So even trying to describe this, we fail, I'm sure. Um, but it just is a sense there's a lot more out there uh, than we certainly uh, now can comprehend. You know, I did my thesis research with a tribe called the Wayanas, and they say that when people want to be a healer, when people take psychedelics, they're trying to gain some special sight, like a sixth sense, whatever you want to call it. But they have a different view of the world and reality. They say that we're all born with that sixth or seventh sense, mm -hmm. but that becoming a shaman means removing a blind field. Mm -hmm. That it's not about learning how to see anew, it means moving what's blocking you. And when you look at William Blake talking about the doors of perception and, and, and peering through the cracks, we're, we're rolling away the stone. And, and, and modern psychology is now accepted that little children under the age of four can have an imaginary friend. Yes. You know, they see other, other spirits, and, and that's considered to be, oh, that's actually part of being a child. Uh, so that that's curious to me is even psychology is saying, no, it's okay if your your three year old has an imaginary friend, or, and, and but then you grow up and as you get older, it's then been, it's then you get narrowed you. vision and all that recedes. You know, we've all had the experience where you dreamed about somebody you hadn't seen since fifth grade, and then the next day they're on the seat in front of you in the plane, yeah. and we're taught, oh, that's a coincidence. There's there's nothing shamanic about that. It's just bullshit. There are no imaginary friends. There is no look into the future. Anybody who had these experiences with these altered realities knows there are other realities. And if you open it up further, where you don't really need uh, psychoactive substance to have these types of Well, this is so, such a strange, and a good, I'm really excited about this, because it's such a strange conversation. Okay, the re conservative religious people out there could say, this, this, these two guys, Mark and Paul, are batshit crazy. <laughs> True. <laughs> well... What about the belief in Jesus Christ? What is about the belief in God? You can't prove God, right? right. Faith, by definition, is faith. Right. Is, is like you're suspending logical deduction, analytical right. analysis. And it's a suspension of disbelief to believe in an ephemeral entity that you can't see, touch, feel, but because it's a Christian religion, it's okay. But I'm, you believe in UFOs. I'm with you. You there. believe in little people. I'm with you. You, there. you believe in something else you can't see. That you can't have the suspension of disbelief. And so to me, it's like it's it's like you know it's like the lie of Santa Claus. When they lied to me about Santa Claus, when I found out I was seven or eight years of age, I said, well, "Okay, what about Jesus? All right, come on now. If you're, you're what about be Amanita Muscari? <laughs> <laughs> I took Richard Schulte's night school course on Plants for the Bible, and in the first class, he described that you know there's other religions like the idea of the Tucanos that humans came from the Milky Way in a sacred canoe with ayahuasca, coca, and manioc. And afterwards, this old lady ran up to the front of the class and said, Professor, I hope we're not going to waste a lot of time on that sort of nonsense. And he says, nonsense? You mean like uh, a snake chasing a naked woman through a garden with an apple in his mouth? Or the Mormons? <laughs> <laughs> Some other planet <laughs> that you go to? I mean, really, I, it's, if we're going to have a tolerance for religion, we should have a tolerance for all the religions. Not the dominant religion in one culture. Whether it's Judaism, whether it's is Islam, whether it's Christianity, whether it's the the, 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 uh, the use of Yahe in the Amazonia, these are all core religious beliefs. They tend to add structure to society to protect the commons, but they're abused by people in positions of power, who then use that authority to become authoritarian to suppress minority opinion. I keep on coming back to this. It's so important that we protect minority opinion. These are the edge runners, the edge thinkers. 
These are the ones who are contrarians who are pushing the envelope. Sure, a lot of them are going to are weird. They're different. Many we now have this phrase that the people are on the spectrum. Uh, you included. We're all on the <laughs> spectrum on at the some spectrum. point. We're some of the most ingenious people that I know are maladapted socially, but they're incredibly talented and they contribute so much. So I think this is this is really we need to have tolerance of diversity and and be able to have these these minority opinions be able to be expressed without oppression. Well, a follow-on to that, my worry coming out of this great conference is psychedelic megachurches. Oh, no. Because as religions gain more power and more adherence, there's more potential for abuse. So, yes, we need to have more tolerance for everybody, but when a religion starts becoming destructive... Well, the megachurches will have structure, they'll have, they'll have ties, they'll have fees, they'll have infrastructure, accountants, they'll have assistance, et cetera, et cetera. But we what live- about being able to go into the forest with yourself and a loved one and have your, your spiritual experience without the constructs you know, of organized religion? But that's got to be recognized as, as, as a form of religion that should be a, form, a part of all religions. Nature bathing, forest bathing, which well, people think, get away from. I think um, it's a fundamental civil right of every citizen on this planet to have the rights to their own consciousness. And I think every conservative, every Republican, libertarian out there, they don't want the government interfering with their personal life. Their threshold of their home, you know, is the barrier they can do inside their homes, as long as they don't hurt somebody, whatever they wish to do. And I think that that perimeter is not your doorway, and not only your doorway, it's, it's your cranial cavity. We should be able to be able to protect and have the freedom to our own consciousness. No government should be able to tell you and control your own consciousness. Well, it seems to me what I know of organized religion, and I'm no student of religions, but that in, in every major religion, you have a, 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 a love of nature and a disdain of nature. And, and, and that has to be worked out better. For example, when the Endangered Species Act looked like it was going down under Newt Gingrich, it was evangelicals who showed up on Capitol Hill and said, Species, God made them, we protect them. They were the ones that came to the rescue. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned Newt Gingrich because I published this new species called Psilocybe Wileyi after Andrew Weil. Uh, and it fruited in Newt Gingrich's front yard of his political office in Georgia. And so the, the, the I mean, these mushrooms have a sense of humor. Clearly. You know, they, so that's, it's just like, I could not believe it. It was like, and that's where so many of the cells I've mushroomed in the Northwest. They fruit around jails, courthouses, you know, institutions of higher learning. This is why the campuses suddenly had psilocybin mushrooms everywhere from wood chips. You know, when there's a beauty bark and wood chip for landscaping, where do they use it? They use it around big buildings and cities. Right. And around schools. Right. And that's why psilocybin mushrooms showed up in the 70s like crazy. And Daniel Stuntz, who's a professor at the University of Washington, head of the botany slash mycology department, when he was brought these psilocybin mushrooms, studied mycology all of his life, he's never seen them. And they were proliferating everywhere around his laboratory. In fact, the species became named Psilocybe stuntsii, uh, after Daniel Stuntz. So, because, so, so that's another example that these mushrooms seem to leap up at a time critical. And then I became a student of his, and here I am today. I heard you tell that story in a Bioneers talk, and my question was, is it hippies that have a sense of humor, or is it God that has a sense of humor that these things show up in prisons and universities? Well, you know, I, I, am, I grew up in a Christian environment, so I, I can speak to this. I, 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 if I had a Bible, I'd have about 10 notches on it for how many times I've been saved. After a while, while it was definitely competition amongst the ministers who could save me, because I clearly was not saved by the other minister, so they're going to try to save me, right? right. So, um, but... I, I don't want to give God a personality, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I thought, I'm a long-haired hippie. I look like Jesus. None of these Christians would pick me up when I was hitchhiking across country. I mean, they like, would you pick up Jesus? Probably not. <laughs> Yet they have a hippie up on the wall <laughs> That's not that they're, right. they're worshiping. So I don't want to personify uh, God. Um, and, the, and I think the need for us to look at an embodiment of God that looks like us, you know, in some fashion, you know, 
eyes, head, legs. White, white. White. <laughs> well, it was very, very dark and became very white, whiter over time. Yeah. Um, but I do subscribe to the concept uh, that we share one giant consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's what I do subscribe to. And we're all just a small part of that. And how, like, the microbiome, the my assembly of microbes, you know, 100 trillion cells uh, compared to, you know, my much fewer cells of actually human cells. You know, these giant colonies and members of this organism that we share, I think, extenuates out to uh, the concept of one giant consciousness. We're, we're all met and have limited amounts of consciousness which collectively comes together to one greater consciousness, and there is one giant consciousness. You can call it God, you can call it something else, but you know, for the lack of words, that's, that's the best I have. So Carl Jung wrote about the collective unconscious, and I wonder if that's what we're accessing when we ingest these. Why unconscious? Why not conscious? Well, that's what he called it. I well, he's mean, wrong. I'm sorry. I'm going to disagree <laughs> Take with that him. up with him, not me. <laughs> I can't. I know. It's kind well, of late I'll try game. it next time. Okay, no, okay, next journey. time around. Okay, yeah. uh, so just to wind things up, uh, I want to go back to Brian Murarescu's book that caused so many waves in the field of divinity and ethnobiology, saying that uh, the Greek Eleusinian mysteries, to go back to Ruck and Wasson, uh, was based on a fungus, and that... Uh, that Christianity, which we think of as rooted in, in Judaism, may have been at least as much, if not more so, rooted in the, this Greek religion, which again was rooted in fungi. What, what's your take on that? Well, I think um, I, I have two stories about that. I, um, I know a lot of people who are devout Christians mm -hmm. who came to Christianity from psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. About 15 years ago, 12 years ago, I'm guessing, I teach these workshops and I taught 3,000 students in tissue culture. And this really nice person showed up in my workshop. He's very quiet, very sort of in introverted person. But he had that kind of glow, you know, mm -hmm. when you meet these people, you know, they're really sent sentient. And he waited till everyone went away. Mm -hmm. um, from, um, and he, he sat with me um, and he said that he had been sent to me and to let me know uh, that the highest levels of Christianity mm -hmm. uh, are now filled with people who have come to Jesus through psilocybin mushrooms. Yeah. And that was, that was pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's more and more people like that. Many of them will never do the mushrooms again, ever. They had that discovery. They have a new life, a new understanding, and so there is a it, there is a merging. Maria Sabina was a practicing Catholic. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I think all these things, you know, point to this commonality of consciousness that we all want to think there is something bigger. We all know there's something bigger, but we can't articulate it. We don't know how to manifest it, and we have these different rituals and pathways: meditation, fasting religious, you know, study. Uh, but it all goes into the same spiritual horizon. It's just that we're on parallel paths. And I don't think they're divergent. I think they're convergent. I think science and spirituality are now coming together. And this is a great point in, in the human evolution. Well, to me, one of the measures of a great shaman is when is a person who will tell you when you need to take an entheogen and when not. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in plenty of ceremonies where I said, can I, should I take another cup? And they said, no, you've had enough. Or, hey, wake up, drink this. And, and that's the measure of a real healer, not somebody who's just after your money or after your soul. And so the idea that the more you take of hallucinogens, the closer you get to God is obvious nonsense. The, the opposite can be true, right? But that these should be seen as vehicles to an end, some of which you may need to take the rest of your life, and some, I've, I've had plenty of people say, I took ayahuasca once and I got what I needed. Yeah. And that's how it should be. Yeah, I'm, you know, you got ayahuasca once. Hopefully it was from a trained therapist, mm -hmm. a person skilled. Mm -hmm. What I object to is the underground commercialization of psychedelics. Yeah. 
I'm going to sound like, again, a total conservative here. But people involved in the drug trade, mm -hmm. they're not paying taxes. Mm -hmm. They're not accepting responsibility for the consequences of the sacraments that they're growing and giving to somebody else. Right. They have a bad trip. It's you own you. part of that. Yeah. Right. And suddenly you're anonymized from them, them and right. they don't know where they came from. They have no. So it's irresponsible, I think, to give a powerful sacrament without being there with a the person. I'm not a therapist, so I'm not the right person to be. So that's why I adopted a long time ago. Nature provides. I don't. And so mm -hmm. the other thing is these same drug dealers, if their house catches on fire, they're going to call the fire department. Mm -hmm. They're freeloaders. Yep. They have freeloaded on the system. They're not paying taxes. Right. They're not paying into the commons. Right. And then if they cloak themselves in the veil of spirituality because they're trying to be spiritual, come on now. <laughs> you're banking hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, not paying taxes, and you're pretending like you're doing it for spiritual purposes. Or protecting purposes. nature or helping the indigenous peoples that taught us. Yeah, so we have to be careful about the freeloaders yes. that are hijacking this message for right. their own personal gain right. without paying respect to the indigenous uh, you know, communities without mm -hmm. paying back to the commons, without you know accepting their share of social responsibility, okay. and that's so. I'm sorry if I pissed off some people there, too, but this too. is my my issue is that everyone should be paying taxes, or no one pays taxes, Agreed. right? Uh, okay. Otherwise, you you know it's just not a fair system. So last last question, if you have a medical issue, and you go to a trained guide, and they give you pure psilocybin, and as an alternative, you go to a paramount shaman of the Mazatex, and she gives you the mushrooms. What's the difference? Well, the difference is quite large, and that's a wonderful question. If you have a severe psychological uh, challenge, you need a professional psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. If you have been experienced, like I think you and I are, mm -hmm. we're fairly emotionally stable. I know that's a real fairly. stretch. <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing the envelope on this one, right? That's a big assumption. But I would rather go to a shaman. I would rather mm -hmm. go to the Mazatec and take a psilocybin mushroom Agreed. because I don't feel like I have the traumatic uh, issues that many other people do that require a professional psychiatrist with a best of medical support possible, mm -hmm. and most importantly, the follow-up. Right. You know, these people go into the mountains, ayahuasca ceremony, have it, and then they go home. Yeah. They're totally separated. Yeah. You know, the people that go into a clinic or into a community of individuals where after the experience, they have a therapeutic support, mm -hmm. and they feel part of a community, mm -hmm. then, again, it's like the long tail. Mm -hmm. You can digest, you can reflect, you can process, you can come to a better space. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, I think, the support network and the degree of the mental challenge the person's facing would determine which is the best for both. I don't think you and I would benefit going to Johns Hopkins, taking psilocybin, putting the blinders, blinders on. on, listening to classical music. <laughs> <laughs> I like some classical music, but most of it I don't. You know, right, I, right. I like sort of uh, Arabic electronica, uh, you know, the Buddha bar stuff. That's yeah, I don't think they'll be playing this stuff at yeah. Johns Hopkins. <laughs> but anyhow, hey, the dead, the dead are great. They led the way. You know, the dead led the way in open source. They led the, they led a, they built a community, a countercultural community. They were training. It was the new subculture of psychedelia. And it was a tribal community. Mm -hmm. It was an indigenous tribal community inside, you know, of a time when the United States and many parts of the world were involved in the Vietnam War and and protests. It was our community. Yep. So, you know, that was our tribe right. in a sense where we developed uh, many of the rituals, few of which have survived right. into medical practice, well, but some of which have. Kurt Vonnegut predicted that we would have to invent our own tribes because we've lost that tribal cohesion in yeah. our industrialized culture. He's yeah. right. It's one example, yeah. one manifestation. Well, you know, a tribe is made up of many clans. Right. Right? Maybe we are one giant human tribe. Right. That's populated with many clans that have individual practices and histories. Yeah, but I think Vonnegut's point was everybody needs their own clan. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, we're part of the human tribe because there's how many billion of us now? Yeah. And people don't feel 
that they belong, and that's one of the reasons for so much mental illness, which I think is being addressed successfully in many cases, or some of the stuff we've been talking about. Well, I just want to really applaud and, and recommend uh, the Roots to Thrive program mm-hmm. in Canada. Mm-hmm. It's a nonprofit. They've now, again, I mentioned taken two cohorts. Roots to Thrive. Yeah, Roots to, th- to Thrive, T H uh, R I V E. Mm-hmm. Um, nonprofit program, uh, pioneered and led by a, a great team of, of health practitioners, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Pam Crisco uh, mm-hmm. being one of the leaders. And they have they have developed a model mm-hmm. that it's, it's based on indigenous wisdom. Indigenous elders are also part of, of the leadership mm-hmm. of this community, um, and they've taken end of life patients who have a commonality. Uh, they face existential, uh, you know, anxiety from getting a terminal diagnosis. They're going to die, mm-hmm. so they come together and they do a high dose of psilocybin after preparation. And then they form their own community subsequently that they can process and talk. So you take the individual cancer patient who's terrified of dying. You put them in a community of other cancer patients or other people afflicted with you know, death-threatening illnesses. And they have a commonality of purpose and sharing, develop bonds and friendships. And I like to mention is when you do that, immunologically, you're elevated. Because mm-hmm. you're happier, you have purpose, you have friends, you're not as isolated. There's many articles in the literature showing that depressed people, emotionally depressed people, are immunologically depressed. And when they feel purpose and they feel happiness, their immune system upregulates. So, mm-hmm. you know, psychological states can influence your medical state, state of being. So, I want Roots to Thrive. It's based on indigenous wisdom, uh, modern medicine. It's two eyes seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it's a great model to to build upon. Well, last point, because you brought this up, I think that one of the issues that this whole community doesn't discuss enough is this issue of death and dying and, and, and life after death, because I think a lot of what we're doing here, especially you and me in, in this generation and Wade, we're kind of a connection between the Schultes <coughs> and Wassons who were connected to the 19th century and looking out for all the youngsters coming up behind us. And this work with these mushrooms, this work with these plants, this work with these indigenous cultures, it's to make sure they're perpetuated. They don't die. Absolutely. This is the legacy that they live on and they benefit humanity, and in so doing, they're preserved as well. Whether it's indigenous cultures, whether it's indigenous practices, whether it's plants and mushrooms. Because I think that's part of the struggle we're engaged in, to make sure these things don't just disappear. You know, Doña Julieta in Wautla told me, since I was a kid, two species of mushrooms have disappeared. We can't use it anywhere. They don't exist. Wow. And that's climate change. That was 25 years ago. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to go back to this thing of, of, of death. I rarely have ever told anyone this. Um, but, you know, I was always just academically thinking about death and life mm-hmm. and spirit. You know, mm-hmm. are there spirits? So it sounds kind of woo-woo out there for all the reasons I explained. But I was at my father's side when he died. Mm-hmm. It was about 2 in the morning. Mm-hmm. He was in a coma for three or four days. And um, I was with him, and his breathing was deep and slow Mm -hmm. and slowing. And then I was the only one in the room. Mm -hmm. And the very moment my father died, Mm -hmm. he arched his back. He opened his eyes. I'm not kidding. His eyes turned blue. And he went... The death breath. Wow. I saw that, and I believed that there was a spirit. Yeah. yeah and yeah. anyone witnessing that, and many of you who have been with your parents have seen that, know exactly what I mean. I don't care if you're an atheist. WTF, how did his eyes go blue? Yeah. And I saw him, and I really felt the presence of his soul, his spirit. And when that happened, he was just a dead physical object. Wow. And that moment wow. convinced me that there is a spiritual universe. It's just our ability to try to understand it is what we fail at, and that's why so many religions have been so many so dangerous to so many of the minority peoples. I, I took a class in medical hypnosis, and it was a week intense class, so I got to talk to everybody in there. Everybody was a nurse except for me and this other guy, and I said, why are you here, why are you here? And 
all of them had the same two answers. They'd been abused sexually as children, or they were with people when they died, they knew there was something. Yeah, same. Doctors are yeah. not with people when they die, nurses are. Yeah. And they said when somebody passes, they somebody see leaves. You can yeah. call it a soul, you can call it a spirit, whatever. They knew it, they saw it. And so this whole issue of, of death and this whole issue of sexual abuse, again, it ties right back into what we're here talking yeah. about. Well, I think, you know, psilocybin, ayahuasca, these other, especially these other tryptamine-based, you know, sacraments, I think they weave us into this spiritual realm of nature that is in existence all the time, all around us. It is the presence that we are immersed in. Thank you, brother. I can't top that. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> My jaw is still hanging slack from that story. Wow. Thank okay. you for sharing that. All right. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to give us a good rating and to subscribe and share with like-minded folks. We appreciate your support for the protection of the knowledge and biodiversity of South America by the Amazon Conservation Team.